On July 9th, at Bush Stadium in St. Louis, the stars of the American and National Leagues gather for the 24th annual All-Star Baseball game. The players on both teams are chosen by popular vote. But this year, the National League team got an unprecedented assist from Commissioner Ford Frick. The junior circuit stars hold a slim 13 to 10 edge in games played to date. But the National Leaguers have taken six of the last seven games. Once again, Casey Stengel of the world champion New York Yankees will direct the American Leaguers. Old Case will have his highly touted catcher, Yogi Berra, behind the plate for catching duties. Berra will be making his eighth straight start for the American League All-Stars. Not since Bertie Tempest was the backstop in 1949 has anyone but Berra done the receiving. Berra is a feared long ball hitter, and because of his ability to drive bad pitches out of the park, he is hard to pitch to. Yogi furnishes the kind of power that the Americans need to get back in the victory column. The Cleveland Indians furnish the first sacker for Casey Stengel. He is Vic Wirtz, who has overcome a serious attack of polio to blossom into one of the most feared hitters in baseball. Vic is always at his best with men on, which makes him one of the leaders in the RBI department. Nellie Fox of the Chicago White Sox is the fans' choice for the American League second base job. The diminutive stick of defensive dynamite is noted for his highway robbery of almost sure hits. At third base will be the old pro of the fast-moving Baltimore Orioles, George Kell. This will be Kell's ninth All-Star Game performance. Short stopping for the junior circuit squad is Harvey Keene of the Detroit Tigers. The Tigers captain is making his fifth all-star appearance. Keene doesn't go for the long ball very often, but his timely singles have driven many enemy pitchers to an early shower. In left field, we find the incomparable and temperamental Ted Williams. The Boston Red Sox slugger has tagged National League all-star pitching for a total of four home runs. Here we see Williams picking up his fourth home run with a mighty smash into the bullpen in the 1956 game. Besides being second in home runs, the splendid splinter leads the hitting parade for this classic with a handsome 361 average for 10 games. The highly praised slugger of the New York Yankees, Mickey Mantle, will man the center field position. No one will forget Mantle's circuit plot following Williams' home run in last year's game. Mantle and Williams give the American Leaguers a solid 1-2 slugging punch. Al Kaline of Detroit rounds out the lineup in right field. Al is a straight type hitter with plenty of RBI potential. The 22-year-old bonus baby adds to the power of an already power-packed lineup for the American League All-Stars of Casey Stengel. K-Line could be the spark that sets off the junior circuit dynamite. Over in the National League side of the ledger, Walter Alston, famed Brooklyn manager, will call the shots. Behind the plate for Alston will be Cincinnati's Ed Bailey. The Red Leg Slugger is making his second All-Star start and is capable of putting the ball out of the park, as you see here. Bailey, who hails from the volunteer state of Tennessee, furnishes the kind of power that the Nationals like. Stan, the man musial of the St. Louis Cardinals, will guard the initial sack for the senior circuit stars. Stan set a record last year when he clouded his fifth all-star home run. Stan is the only player who survived the big Cincinnati landslide. A real tribute to his nationwide popularity. Johnny Temple on the left and teammate Roy McMillan of the Cincinnati Redlegs will team up for the second straight year to form a great double play combination for the Nationals. Here you see one of the double plays Temple and McMillan executed in last year's tussle. 
although he lost out to McMillan in the final tabulation, Al Dark of the St. Louis Cardinals should see some action at shortstop. The hitting surprise of the Cincinnati Redlegs, Don Hope will be stationed at the hot corner. Hope, who only hit 215 for the Cubs in 1956, has done plenty of timely hitting for the charges of Bertie Cabots this year. Milwaukee's Ed Matthews led the third base voting most of the way, but lost out to Hope after the barrage of Cincinnati votes turned the tide. The Santa Barbara Bomber is capable of putting the ball out of the park at any given minute, and he could be an alternate. Frank Robinson of Cincinnati has been in the league only two years. In two years, he has made the all-star team in left field. Robinson has continued his great play this year after being named Rookie of the Year in 1956. The Beaumont, Texas youngster is among the leaders in both batting averages and home runs so far this season. The spectacular play of Willie Mays has put the New York Giants into the thick of things in the Torrid National League pennant scramble but it took the commissioner's office to put him in center field for the All-Star game. The tremendous voting surge in Cincinnati actually would have put seven red legs in the starting lineup. Brooklyn's Duke Snyder had to play second fiddle this year, but the Dodgers slugger possesses the kind of power that no manager can keep out of the lineup for any length of time. And he is a probable alternate. Hammering Hank Aaron rounds out the National League team in right field, also by way of the commissioner's office. Hank is at his best with runners on base, and that is why he is the RBI leader of the league. The Mobile Alabama powerhouse is famous for his bad ball hitting, and Hank makes it pay off in singles and home runs. It looks like another victory for the National League All-Stars on July 9th. game time. Heated pennant races in the major leagues are interrupted once again for baseball's annual mid-season classic. It's the 24th meeting between the greatest stars of the American and National League. And this time, the scene of the dream game is Bush Stadium in St. Louis, the home of the Cardinals. It's the ballpark where Stan Musial is making history to carry on the legendary lore of such former Cardinal heroes as Joe Medwick and Johnny Mize the Cooper brothers, the old gas house gang of Dizzy and Paul Dean, Pepper Martin and Leo DeRocha, Rip Collins, Frankie Frisch, and such earlier Cardinal stars as Rogers Hornsby, Jim Bottomley, and Grover Alexander. This is the 14th All-Star game for Musial, high for any player in the Interleague Classic, which was inaugurated in 1933. Stan leads an All-Star homers with five. The other glamour figure of all-star play is Ted Williams of the Boston Red Sox, who is appearing for the 13th time. He has an all-star average of 361. Ted has kept busy autographing before the game. Official host at this year's all-star game is August Bush, owner of the St. Louis Cardinals. Commissioner Ford Frick, supreme authority in all interleague competition, is an early arrival. President Will Harris of the American League is here with Ben Fiery, the league's longtime attorney. 
Harridge's regime spans the entire history of the All-Star Series. Warren Giles, president of the National League, is bubbling with confidence, as well Eagles have won six of the last seven All-Star games. Others on the National League side are Mr. and Mrs. Lou Carroll. Carroll heads the National League legal staff. Other prominent baseball officials in the crowd are owner Tom Yorkey and general manager Joe Cronin of the Red Sox. Also, general manager George Weiss, the man responsible for building championship Yankee teams. Casey Stengel of the Yankees, who piloting the American Leaguers once more, is the center of a swarm of newspaper men. Walt Olson of the Dodgers, who will direct the National Leaguers, is being interviewed by one of the broadcasters, Al Helfer. Alston will be happy to have a fellow named Hank Aaron of the Milwaukee Braves on his side for a change. Aaron won the batting title in 1956 and also was voted the National League Player of the Year by the Sporting News. Among the American Leaguers, the greatest of the new generation of sluggers is Mickey Mantle of the Yankees, winner of the triple batting crown in his league in 1956. As the players take their warm-up practice, there is a wonderful spirit of comradeship among them. Intense rivalry within each league is dissolved until the pennant races are resumed. Here's Nellie Fox, peppery second sacker of the White Sox, with shortstop Harvey Keene of Detroit. Al Kaline, the superb hitting star and accomplished right fielder of the Tigers, is ready for action. Ernie Banks of the Chicago Cubs. Frank Robinson of the Cincinnati Redlegs. Hank Aaron of the Milwaukee Braves, and Willie Mays of the New York Giants. These four sluggers are on the same ball club would guarantee a pennant in any league. They totaled 128 home runs last year. Here's the first baseman with long ball authority, Gil Hodges of Brooklyn, and Cleveland has another in Vic Wirtz. Two of the top flight pitchers of the National League from the arch rival Giants and Dodgers talk shop. They're Johnny Antonelli, the star southpaw, and Clem Labine, one of the game's most brilliant relief men. And here are two pitchers who have made the Braves a leading pennant contender, Warren Spahn and Lou Burdett. Bobby Chance of the Yankees and Billy Pierce of the White Sox have a lot in common. These veteran lefties not only are among the smallest pitchers in baseball, but also among the greatest. The starting catchers of the All-Star game, Ed Bailey of Cincinnati and Yogi Berra of the Yankees, get together for a moment before they retire to don their protective gear. With the National League loaded with right-handed power, Stengel decides to start Jim Bunning of Detroit, a slender, side-arming right-hander. The 25-year-old Bunning was in the minors most of the 1956 season but he began this year in sensational fashion. Alston faces the opposite situation. The American League has four left-handed swingers, including Ted Williams, in its lineup. Alston, therefore, names a southpaw as his starter, Kurt Simmons of the Phillies. The veteran lefty hasn't been scored upon in five previous innings in all-star competition. And here are the starting lineups for the American League. Harvey Keene, Detroit shortstop, Nellie Fox, Chicago White Sox, second base. Al Kaline, Detroit, right field. Mickey Mantle, New York Yankees, center field. Ted Williams, Boston Red Sox, left field. Vic Wirtz, Cleveland, first base. Yogi Berra, New York Yankees, catcher. George Kell, Baltimore, third base. Jim Bunning, Detroit pitcher. For the National League, Johnny Temple, Cincinnati, second base. Hank Aaron, Milwaukee, right field. Dan Musial, St. Louis Cardinals, first base. Willie Mays, New York Giants, center field. Ed Bailey, Cincinnati, catcher. Frank Robinson, Cincinnati, left field. Don Hope, Cincinnati, third base. Roy McMillan, Cincinnati, shortstop. Kurt Simmons, Phillies, pitcher. The umpires come to the plate, along with the manager, Stengel and Alston, for a brief discussion of ground rules. Six umpires are assigned, with extra men posted down the foul lines. The players of the National League team pour out of their dugout onto the field and bring a roar from the crowd of approximately 30,000 that fills flag-bedecked Bush Stadium to its bulging capacity. 
But the applause is soon hushed as the band begins the national anthem and the flag is raised in center field. As the final strains of the Star Spangled Banner come echoing back from the huge scoreboard, there is another outburst from the fans. The air is cracking with a tension of expectancy. Simmons takes his preliminary warm-up throws from the mound, and the 1957 All-Star game is underway. Harvey Keen, the opening batter, flies out to Robinson. But it's different in the second inning. Mickey Mantle gets the first hit of the game by beating out a slow bouncer to Don Hope. Simmons now has Ted Williams to contend with. He walks him. Vic Wirtz smashes a single past Roy McMillan into left field, and Mantle scores. Yogi Berra walks to fill the bases. And that's all for Simmons. National League manager Walt Austin calls in Hooper Dead of the Milwaukee Braves. Burdett gets George Callen a foul to Musial. He appears to be out of trouble, but he also retires Bunning in a pop-up to McMillan. But then Burdett loses control and walks Keen, forcing in Williams. And the American League leads two to nothing. Jim Bunning, meanwhile, has been mowing the National League is down in rapid fire order. Burdett lines out to Mantle for the last out in the third inning. And that completes three sensational innings for the young Tiger pitcher in his all-star debut. He hurled three perfect innings, not allowing a man to reach base. Billy Lowe's of the Baltimore Orioles follows Bunning to the mound in the fourth inning. Hank Aaron collects the first National League hit when he singles to Fox behind second base. Musial doubles off the right field screen and the National League is threatening for the first time. As Willie Mays, a 500 hitter in these All-Star Classics, is the next batter. However, Mays pops the Fox. Then Bailey grounds out to Bill Scourin, and the rally is squelched. In the fifth inning, the National League seems on the way again when Robinson opens with a single. Ed Matthews bats for Hope and lines the ball to right field. It's a hit, but wait, Kaline scoops up the ball and fires to McDougal at second base. It's a force out of Robinson, who held up thinking the ball would be caught. The hit, therefore, is wiped out, and so is the rally. as Lowe's pitches his way out of another jam by making Ernie Banks hit into a fast double play, Malzone to Fox to Starro. Jack Sanford, the spectacular rookie fastballer of the Phillies, faces the American Leaguers in the sixth. After one out, Starro doubles to right. third base on a wild pitch. 
Then Yogi Berra singles to left. And Scourin trots home. It gives the American League a three to nothing lead. K-Line helps preserve that margin in the last half of the sixth when he makes a leaping catch off the bat of Shane Dean in the right field wall. Billy Lowe's thereby also completes three scoreless innings. An early win of Cleveland replaces him in the seventh inning. After one out, Mays singles to left. Bailey singles to right, and Mays dashes to third. Gus Bell of Cincinnati then bats for his Red Lake teammate, Robinson. He wallops a double that Williams finally retrieves in the left field corner. While Mays and Bailey race home. Casey Stengel strolls to the mound and decides on a pitching change. He wigwags for Billy Pierce, the brilliant Chicago White Sox southpaw. Matthews grounds out, scouring to Pierce, who covers first base. With a tying run now on third. Pierce strikes out Banks. The rally is checked, but the National League has cut the lead to three to two. In the eighth, after Mantle walks, Williams pulls a towering drive to center that seems destined for his fifth all-star homer, but Mays hauls it in near the wall. Clem Levine of Brooklyn is on the mound in the ninth of the National League. Pierce opens by beating out a hit to Shane Deep. McDougal pushes a slow roller through the box, and Shane Dean fumbles this one just as he's about to flip the ball to second base, and both runners are safe. Fox then advances the runners with a sacrifice bunt, and misses by an eyelash for beating it out. K-Line follows with a single to center. Scoring both Pierce and McDougal. Minnie Minoso, who had replaced Williams in the eighth, comes to the plate with two out. He misses a terrific cut. But not the next time, he lashes the ball off the screen in right center for a double. And K-Line tallies. It extends the American League lead to six to two, apparently a safe margin as Pierce has retired five straight batters. But Billy suddenly seems to have lost control. He walks Musial to launch the National League ninth. Mays drops a hit down the right field line. And it goes for a triple, scoring Musial. Mays also tallies a moment later when Pierce unleashes a wild pitch. Hank Foyles bats for Bailey and keeps the rally rolling with a single. Pierce also walks Gus Bell, and now the two tying runs are on base. Stengel calls a halt and brings in the Cleveland lefty Don Morsey to face the powerful southpaw swinger Matthews. Morsey fires the third strike past Matthews for the first out of the inning. There are no soft touches now. Next up is Banks, plugging shortstop of the Cubs. He smashes a single to left and foils scores. 
But on the hit, Dell tries to dash to third and is cut down by Minoso's beautiful throw to Frank Malzone. Banks takes second on the throw. The National League now needs a hit to get that tying run home. Austin calls on his Dodger home run threat, Gil Hodges, for this final bid. Dengel counters with another pitching change. This time his own right-handed Yankee relief star, Bob Grimm. Hodges digs in at the plate. There goes Pinoso streaking after the ball. And he hauls it down to end the game and give the American League a 6-5 victory. They're 14th against 10 for the National League. It was Minoso who was the eventual hero, driving across what proved to be the winning run and then saving the game with a magnificent throw as well as a final brilliant catch. But others shared in the glory, such as pitchers Jim Bunning and Billy Lowe. In fact, the players in both lineups were all-stars. For this is the game in which the greatest in baseball blend into one team effort. For that, in essence, is what makes baseball the national pastime. See a ball game often. Follow your local team. It's fun for the entire family. Now let's join Jim Leeming in an exclusive interview with the National Leaguer starting pitcher, Kurt Simmons. This is Jim Leeming at Connie Mack Stadium in the city of Philadelphia. Standing next to me, the fellow you saw just a few days ago starting the All-Star game out in St. Louis, one of baseball's original bonus babies, the Phillies left-hander, Kurt Simmons. Kurt, it's real good to see you and talk to you again. Good to see you, Jimmy. Uh, Kurt, your career has uh, been one of ups and downs, actually, when you first uh, came up to the big league with a sensational start and then in 1950 to uh, have helped the Phillies into the World Series and then into the service, out of the service, had a couple of, of, of years when it wasn't too certain whether you were going to make it or not, and now you seem to have come back. Uh, Kurt, uh, what do you think caused, besides the, the accident, your, your slump after your days in the service? Well, I don't know, Jim. I, I Like you said, I hurt my toe, and... And then, of course, I hurt my arm about a year later. I don't think the uh, toe accident had anything to do with hurting my arm, but uh, it was something that happened, and, and it, it slowed me up for a year, about a year and a half. So I was having trouble. Uh, I'd, I'd pitch a ball game, and I was having trouble getting back and bouncing back and starting again. Uh, Kurt, let me ask you this. As uh, you look back on your career when you came up, you were very young, and now you put a little age on you, still in your 20s, of course, but uh, a little bit more mature. Have you found that you have changed very much as far as your outlook on the game, your your style of pitching, and uh, just baseball in general? Well, I think as far as my pitching is concerned, I I don't throw quite as hard, maybe, and, and I don't think I'm quite as wild either, although in that All-Star game, I did walk a couple guys that really got me in trouble. Uh, but I think that I'm changing speeds and pitching a little more than I used to. I'm, when I started, naturally, any kid starting out, he just throws the ball and, and relies on the power, but uh, after a few years, and, and of course, since I hurt my arm, I, I don't think I'm quite as fast, and I have to change up and, and change my speed a bit. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, Kurt Simmons was the starting pitcher for the National League in the All-Star game, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, Kurt went through that first inning without any difficulty at all, and then all of a sudden in the second inning, they seemed to get to him. He did get a little bit wild. Uh, Kurt, just uh, what happened in the second inning of the All-Star Game at St. Louis? Well, Jimmy, in that uh, that first thing, like you said, I was getting the ball over, and I got those uh, three guys out in a row, and then that uh, second inning, I uh, Mantle got that scratch hit, and, uh, of course, uh, I walked Williams on a three-and-two pitch, which uh, I thought a couple pitches were pretty close, but uh, Williams, uh, being a good ball hitter, he doesn't play any bad pitches, and I walked him. Uh, the other guy... Uh, Worth hit the ball into the hole into left field, and, and uh, Mantle scored on the play. Uh, then uh, I walked there on four pitches, and of course, uh, 
Commander Austin uh, lifted me in for Lou Burdett. Well, Kurt, it was unfortunate that you did have to be lifted, and of course more unfortunate that you had to be charged with the loss in the All-Star game, but I'm sure there are uh, better things to come as this National League progresses. Uh, everybody talks about it. It's a five-team race. Uh, most of the managers say that it's going to go right down to the wire. Uh, you're in there all of the time. Uh, how do you think it's uh, going to be, and what has caused this uh, real torrid race in the lane? Well, I don't know exactly what caused it. I think that the five clubs are having trouble getting going. I think that uh, they're all having their troubles, especially Brooklyn. They, they don't seem to be hitting the ball like they did, and, and of course, Mangley and Erskine have been having arm trouble along with Padres, and, and that was uh, the team to beat, but uh, they've been having their troubles, and it's, it's been, everything's jumbled up, and, and the Cardinals and ourselves uh, definitely have uh, outside chances to win the pennant, and, uh, and of course, we, we have to rely on our pitching. We haven't been hitting the ball too good, but if we can do any hitting at all, I think that we'll definitely be up there in September, and I just hope that we can uh, be a little lucky and, and win that pennant. Kurt Simmons, thank you very much. It's been enjoyable talking to you, and let's hope that it's another 1950 and you can help your teammates into that World Series cut. Well, fine. I hope it happens.